morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests onto the stage. Good morning, uh, dear guests of our summit, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'm very happy to greet you here in Kazan Federal University on the territory of the Institute of the Economy and Management, and uh, allow me please first of all to express uh, my gratitude and appreciation to the Minister of Science and Higher Education of the Russian Federation and to the Deputy Minister of uh, this Minister, Marina Barovska, to the President Administration of the Russian Federation uh, with its uh, Yulia Minska, to Ministry of uh, Health Care and it's uh, one of its department, Tatiana Semyonova. Our partners, the British company Times and its chief editor, Phil Betty, who believed into our potential and honored us to become a host of this summit. And I would like to say special thanks to the government of the Republic of Tatarstan and its uh, prime minister, Mr. Pesoshin, uh, who is a graduate of our university, our alumni, and the head of the investment agency and cooperation of Republic of Tatarstan, Telia uh, Minula, for their support, financial support and organizational support. And uh, she graduated from our university as well. So today's event is the first uh, summit uh, of times, which is oriented to the European and Asia countries, and is the second one in the Russian Federation. And now allow me to uh, give floor to the Prime Minister of Republic of Tatarstan, to Mr. Pesoshin. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, dear colleagues, dear friends, and on behalf of the President of Republic of Tatarstan, Mr. Minikhanov, on behalf of our government, and from me personally, let me greet you here on the opening ceremony of this summit of the advanced scientific research. And I'm very glad to uh, open this uh, significant event here in, this, in my alma mater, and uh, which is uh, now is one of the most advanced and deve uh, fast developing Russian universities. And for us, it's a great honor to host and introduce the public of Tatarstan here, introduce it to the world scientific community to meet with the influential educational institutions and companies, and it's a great opportunity to share and to borrow their experience and uh, to talk about the most burning issues of the science and education. And of course, this event will facilitate further strengthening of our mutually uh, beneficial cooperation among our countries to develop new uh, promising ideas and strategies, and uh, allow me to read the greeting address of our President, Mr. Minihanov. Uh, dear friends, let me uh, wholeheartedly greet you here in the capital of Republic of Tatarstan in Kazan. We are thankful for the organizers who made decision to organize such a big event in our republic, and we take it as a recognition of the achievements of the Russian Federation in general and uh, and Tatarstan specific in development of the higher education. The summit is devoted to the most important issues of improving the system of the uh, vocational and uh, higher education and increasing the role of universities in the development of the countries and the human kind in general. Tatarstan traditionally is, uh, in our country, is one of the leading regions in terms of the quality of education the Republic has 
the uh, sustainable system of education of the higher education, which is including federal <coughs> universities, research universities, and other important uh, insti uh, educational facilities. We are actively developing the scientific schools in chemistry, petrochemical industries, medicine, uh, philology, human humanities. We are proud of its achievements, and we hope that within this, this summit our guests will be able to familiarize with the potential of our republic. And based on this, we'll build our further mutually beneficial cooperation. Let me wish all this summit its uh, uh, fruitful work and uh, successes and uh, new successful solutions. Pre President of Volkar Tatarstan, Mr. Minehanov. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, let me just join to the uh, presidential address and wish you successful work uh, in this summit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alexei, um, for your support uh, of our university. And uh, we are always supported and understood by our government. And I would like to give floor to the Deputy Minister of Education and Science of Russian Federation, to Marina Barovska, please. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm very glad to be here and greet all of you here, uh, here in Kazan, in Kazan Federal University. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, this summit uh, uh, in which we participate all, it will allow us, I hope, to uh, understand uh, for us as a minister, minister of education, uh, to understand the uh, most important issues and I really would like to send congratulations and greetings of our minister and to express his support of our minister to all universities and to the EU partners uh, universities in which we work together and probably for this our new ministry which was newly organized is newly organized it is important for us to understand and to define the main priorities uh, which are important in organizing the work of the higher education system and uh, important for our organization of the scientific work, research work within our institutions. And I would like to show you uh, some slides and in the presentation, share main ideas. May I have my presentation, please? Oh, thank you. And uh, I hope I will have, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, in the greeting uh, address, uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I would like to say that that uh, nowadays in Russian Federation we have already had uh, very significant changes which reflect the modernization and improvement of the system of a higher education. And now we see that this work uh, has been uh, always a sustainable work from the beginning of the 2000s and now uh, we have reached a lot. We understand that the uh, set of instruments and the uh, um, management of uh, higher education is already uh, working and it's efficient and now we understand that we are moving from one stage to the next one. And it's very important for us to understand where we are now and where we're going in the Russian Federation to support uh, our educational institutions. For us, it is important to understand that uh, on the map of Russia, uh, how these universities are uh, located there, the federal universities, the key universities, and the network of universities, which uh, uh, we call the leading universities, and uh, this system, of course, has universities uh, which train people all over the territory of the Russian Federation. This network of universities is supported by projects uh, uh, within the 2017-2018 decrees of the government. This is support of cooperation with the leading universities uh, in the world and the technology transfer cooperation, which is supported by the government as well. And speaking about the changes and transformations which we have had during this period, I would like to say that the system of the higher education Russian Federation has already passed all these main stages of concentrating and distributing resources and the steps which we are uh, going through now. They're oriented, of course, on 
the connection between universities and their potential em uh, employers. Now, you said that we have uh, in our uh, presidium two graduates of the university uh, because uh, our graduates will find work and uh, have to find work on the market. And uh, speaking of how the system of education looks like now, uh, we have to say that uh, for us it is a big stimulus to work with our industrial partners, with the uh, businesses. This is where we see success of our universities and uh, the, uh, and, uh, the, the latest results in our work and success in our joint work with industries is just a good indicator of it. Uh, the regions of Russia uh, Federation, the social structure of the uh, Russian Federation, uh, closely connected with the universities, and they work together, local administrations and universities. And, uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, I hope and uh, that the cooperation which we are organizing now and by through participation in this kind of forums and events. And it's a very important step in establishing cooperation with the world educational community. And I wish you very successful work in this direction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to give floor to uh, uh, Teli Minulina, head of the a agency for investment and development of our republic, uh, who is a graduate of our university as well. Good morning, dear colleagues. And uh, let me greet you here because most of the participants of our summit uh, represent an international community. Uh, we decided to uh, make my presentation in English. It is a pleasure for me to welcome all of you here in, in Tatarstan Republic in Russia. And my name is Talia. I am uh, the youngest minister in Tatarstan government and I'm responsible for investment activities. So I'm a head of investment agency. Yesterday there was the first day of our session and it was fantastic, to be honest. It is a great pleasure for us to welcome this international event in Russia and in Tatarstan and in Kazan State Federal University that I graduated from and it's a great honor for me as well. So um, the agency that I represent works with investors on a single window principle. As you can see on the slide, the investor comes to the agency and then after that we take care of him like a mother of a kid day by day and after that he becomes a member of our investors club. And once he have any problem, this is our problem as well. Once he's happy, we are happy. As simple as that. So if you are interested in investing into Russia, please be, be aware that Tatarstan would be the best place for doing so in our country. Um, according to, inter uh, to federal ranking, Tatarstan was ranked number one as the best place for investment on investment climate in 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, today we enjoy investors from all around the world. And what we started to do recently is not only opening large scaled enterprises and international offices and branches and nets, but what is important is started to open international R&D centers. This year, in 2018, we opened the first R&D center in Russia of Schneider Electric Company and first R&D center of Ericsson Company in Russia, also in Tatarstan. What does that mean? That means that we today understand the process of globalization and the necessity of R&Ds in our system, an educational system, an economic system, industrial system. This is the basis where we get money from to make the quality of life of our people better. So the basis of all international investors' work in, in new territories, as well as the basis of country's success, is obviously education. This is why Tatarstan government pays so much attention and invests itself to the development of the educational system. So um, 
because we don't have enough time um, to tell you about our economic opportunities and investment opportunities, I would love to inspire you to visit the website that we specially developed for our international investors. Invest.tatastan.com. Um, it's available in 11 different languages. It covers two-thirds of the planet and the richest countries of the world. And I know that we have um, representatives from more than 20 countries uh, here within the conference. Um, it is important for us to be w very well connected to the world, to be globally integrated, to be reliable strategic partners to the international scientific and educational society. So once you have any ideas on our partnership that we are ready to establish here for you, please um, feel free to contact us. Um, so I know that here we only have clever people. And what I know for sure is that higher education meets lots of challenges today. The speed of technological development, the industrial revolution for zero, and many other things. But my question to you is, do we really need higher education today? And if so, how should we reshape the form of higher education? And what can we do about the remodernizing and re-innovation of higher education system of the world. And I believe that this is the right audience uh, to be addressed to by this question. Um, <clears throat> the higher education now is not what people did once in their lives as it used to be before. The higher education today is a fundamental basis for the lifelong learning and Many questions that we have in our minds we should address to each other within this conference and I hope that all of us will be able to find at least some answers to these global international important questions. And clever people always ask questions a lot of why because this is the scheme. You see, if we know a little, we have questions, but if we know more, we have more questions. So I want you to find some answers to the questions that all of us, that we all have during these days. And um, another important issue, coming back to the higher education, is that many international companies today, like Google, Apple, Ernst & Young, what they announced just recently is that they're going to hire people with no higher education. For example, IBM tells the world that they are new engineer on finance and blockchain, as well as their leading recruitment manager. These are the examples of professions and of the positions in IBM company that is an international worldwide company. The higher education is not needed anymore, whereas the salaries are $150,000 on an annual basis. So this is the example how the whole education system of the world is changing. Um, finally, I would love to address you as to our investors, dear investors. Why would you be investor of Tatastan would be your question. But you are already, already our investors because what you are doing at the moment, you are investing your time, your health to Tatastan being here. So I wish you to have the payback period of this investment really small and to, to get as much profit back to this, your investment, as you can. Welcome to Tatastan and invest to Tatastan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Спасибо, Тали Ергизовна. А сейчас я с удовольствием хочу предоставить слово человеку, который поверил в нас и принял решение провести данные. Trusted us and decided to organize the summit and our platform to Mr. Phil Betty. Could you please? Thank you very much. So a new world order is emerging. The vast landmass of Eurasia bridging west and east from Lisbon to Vladivostok is at the heart of a major global geopolitical transformation. Of course, the ancient Silk Road provided connections between west and east centuries ago, but the idea of Eurasia as a region of huge strategic significance on the world stage is real as never before. The American journalist Robert Kaplan in his book, The Return of Marco Polo's World, 
argues that the Eurasian supercontinent has only now truly become one fluid and comprehensible unit. Since the opening of the Iron Curtain across Europe and China's opening up to the world, he says that the idea of Eurasia simply has meaning in the way that it didn't used to. New infrastructure, new trade routes, new opportunities for the mobility of people and ideas across this supercontinent are making the huge world island of Eurasia perhaps the most exciting and dynamic region of the world today. And being here in this great city, in this state of Tatarstan, in this country, Russia, it feels like we're at the epicenter of this extraordinary shift in the world's center of gravity. So this event here in Kazan feels like an exceptionally important part of Times Higher Education's Global World Summit Series. Over the last five years, we've put on wonderful events in the US, in South America, in the UK, across continental Europe, in China, in South Korea, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in India, and in many other countries. But I believe it is particularly important that we have gathered here in Russia, in Tatarstan, for our first ever meeting dedicated to this extraordinarily important region of Eurasia. I'm pleased to confirm we've brought together more than 270 senior leaders from universities and governments and industry from around 20 nations for this event. We have guests from Russia, from Kazakhstan, from Iran, from Pakistan, from Saudi Arabia, from China, Hong Kong, Turkey, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, as well as from India, Japan, the United Kingdom, Italy, the United States, and Australia, I welcome you all to this fantastically diverse international event. So we have a vast range of experience, of expertise, from a diverse and dynamic group of people in the room today. And I'm very much looking forward to some outstanding contributions, not just from our excellent guest speakers, but from all of our delegates. One of the special characteristics of the THG summits is that we like to share. You to share your views and ideas and share your experience and share your expertise. So please make the most of the fact that the sessions will be interactive with time for open discussion. Please do all play your part. Your active participation is vital for the success of the summit and the legacy of this meeting. And we want to ensure we build a long-term legacy for this meeting for this gathering of individuals. And at times, higher education will be sharing too. We'll be sharing some new data to help inform the discussions that we'll have, and no doubt to stimulate some passionate debates. Drawing from our vast World University Rankings database, I will publish tonight the first ever Times Higher Education ranking of Eurasian nations. I can't give too much away about the data right now until the results go live this evening and we'll explore the data in much much greater detail tomorrow morning at a special uh, data session but what i can say is that the the data reveals both major challenges for the universities in this region and of course massive massive opportunities we can address some of the challenges later and tomorrow for now i'll focus on the opportunities in the THE data, we can see great strengths of universities in this region. First, there is real diversity of excellence across the Eurasia region. Of the top institutions, individual strengths vary, as do the individual histories, the cultures, and missions of the institutions, suggesting a healthy mixed economy of universities across the region. There's also diversity of geography, Three nations make the top 10 of the new list, demonstrating strength across the vast landmass of Eurasia. And finally, there is strength in depth. Some 13 of the universities that appear in this evening's ranking are among the elite group of world top 500 universities. So many nations here have global flagship universities that stand proud on the world stage and compete with the very best universities across the whole world. So what I can see from the THE data is a diverse and dynamic region poised for greater future success. And that's also what I see today here in this room 
of wonderful international guests. So thank you very much for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to the next few days. Thank you. Of the summit, we are receiving various telegrams. May I read one out loud? It is on, on behalf of the leader of the nearby region, the subject of the Russian Federation, Mikhail Ignatiev. A few quotes. I welcome the representatives of the Times Higher Education Research Excellence Summit. I'm confident that the decisions of the summit would very much promote the eco dialogue and partnerships relationships between the leading representatives of the intellectual elite of Russia, foreign colleagues, the leaders in the area of higher education. Uh, quite symbolic that the time for hosting the summit, which is organized in the partnership with Confederal University, is uh, Russia and the city of Kazan, the capital of the Republic of Tatarstan. Uh, Mr. Ignatiev mentions the fact that he's confident that this platform would become an effective site for discussions of the development strategies of university development, their contribution into the human and socioeconomic development. The head of the Republic of Chuashia, Mr. Ignatiev. Dear ladies and gentlemen, as for now, may I make a short presentation of our Kazan Federal University for you to have the context of where, where we all are and what Kazan University is doing. I believe you would have a, ch a chance to visit our labs and campuses in line with your interests. As for the moment, I would like just to go through some points to uh, show you some of the points uh, about the concept of development of the university capable of addressing various challenges of the developing world to, to, as well as to achieve the tasks that we are facing in the country to reach our objectives. We chose five, five priority areas, biomedicine, pharmaceuticals uh, first, petroleum extraction, refining, petrochemistry second, and communications space technology third, advanced materials fourth, social studies and in humanities, primarily aimed at the new teacher education methodology, as well as inclusion of our historical heritage objects in the UNESCO World Heritage Register. All of these dimensions are uh, interdisciplinary and are very much responding to the global challenges. These are the priorities we have concentrated our main financial infrastructure and human resources. Uh, as of today, employee Employees are engaged in various research and other projects on so priority areas. It is about 88% in our priority dimensions that are shown on the slide. These priorities are very much in concordance with the tasks that are being set by the president of our country, Vladimir Putin. For the implementation of uh, priority dimensions, we have reformatted the system of administration of the university, including the educational process and research. In particular, a distributed management model was introduced. On the slide, you can see how it's implemented in the field of biomedicine pharmaceutics. Our example, where there is a core or institute of fundamental medicine biology, as well as supporting ones that have respective structures that are doing that in their dimensions. For example, maybe we can give uh, some examples physics for medicine or chemistry for medicine, uh, engineering for medicine, uh, neuro linguistics aspects for medicine, etc. Respective dimensions are developing in the platforms of respective thematic. Uh, disciplinary institutes. At the same time, the research of topics and funding are being defined by the core institute that is championing this. Such a distributed model is used for the implementation of all of our projects and priority areas. At the same time, supervisors of these areas are simultaneously being directors of respective core institutes and have vice rector status. Uh, 
Thus, we have two formats of vice rectors, the heads of priority areas, as well as uh, pro-rectors in specific dimensions, such as education-wise, uh, scientific research-wise, as well as international relations. Obviously, the transformation also imply changing approaches to organizing research. We have created the so-called open labs, which we understand as tailor-made infrastructural platforms with uh, world-level equipment, which are highly autonomous in their budget planning, as well as personnel management. We are inviting leading Russian or and foreign scientists uh, with respective, uh, their own respective research projects in the area of the priorities we have selected, as well as young ambitious researchers with experience of work in uh, global projects. At the moment, we have uh, over 70 open labs of the kind and uh, 12 excellent centers. And the number of lab employees varies from, from 10 to 160 individuals per lab. Today, these labs are successfully integrating, involving in the global research and educational networks. The university development model is also constantly changing, and it has answered various challenges at different stages. Uh, in line with the agenda of the Russian Federation development. In particular, we are currently implementing the University 3.0 uh, model, uh, which uh, helps uh, quickly commercialize ideas and works of our employees through specific translational platforms. Here we include our university clinics, secondary schools, engineering centers, advanced training centers, etc. Over here on the slide, you see respective uh, information about the priorities I mentioned. Uh, this uh, approach allows us to develop necessary competencies in our students, uh, helping them acquire uh, to initiate and develop various innovations at the university. Simultaneously, we are now working at developing the University 4.0 model, uh, the one that is to address the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. And this slide is showing the general overview of the model. It's important to understand here that digitization is not a panacea from all the problems. Digital technology is necessary, but certainly not sufficient. Transformations must touch also, first and foremost, the core of the university, is research and education. These basic components must evolve very much also in the aspect of the fourth industrial revolution technologies. They must be reshaped according to the new trends Big data, first of all, Internet of Things, virtual reality, as well as augmented reality, additive technologies, robotics, genomic and proteomics, uh, quantum computing, blockchain, artificial intelligence, driverless transport, and other trends. You'll be able to see all this demonstrated at various exhibits we have demonstrated here for the participants, as well as to see with your own eyes when visiting our labs and university platforms. At the same time, we are tasking ourselves with the development and accumulation of human potential, the so-called beers and generation generators of the new knowledge and technology. Our task is to form a critical mass of young leaders of change. We work to attract young people uh, to our strategic tasks, but, and we are devising and implementing a system of various motivational measures. You, would, you could see some of these young employees uh, yesterday who were moderating our, uh, the round tables. They, they are also here in this room, as well as the various exhibit stands uh, showing our latest developments. Obviously, I would call on you to dedicate some time to them. Lately, we increased the number of the young supervisors uh, six times, and overall, the uh, at the same time, the average age of research staff has decreased to 44 years old. To develop and hand over our values and best practices, we launched our own corporate university. This slide is showing the main trends of the transform transformation of ours. We have significantly improved our financial positions, made sure that the employment in the university is becoming more attractive uh, compared to the way it was before vis-a-vis -vis other industries, improved the environment for both students and the educators. Serious shifts uh, have emerged in research output, we have increased the quantity of WS and SCO, uh, Web of Science and Scopus publications eightfold in five years. In part 
and in the first and second uh, quartile journals reached 60 overall 60 and 70 percent in priority areas moreover in this period of time web of science and scopus databases have included six um, journals uh, published by kazan federal university as an integrative result and an objective evaluation of the above mentioned successful transformations in our academic life uh, is obviously the university's progress in international rankings such as Times Higher Education as well as QS, both in global as well as in subject lists. And in some of the latter, we are already close to the top 100 universities of the world. We are obviously looking forward to the optimism because the model we have developed is not based on some virtual or cosmetic changes, but on systemic transformation and the long-term potential for the development of our priority areas in accordance with global challenges and the national objectives we have to address. I believe it would allow us to hope uh, to successfully implement all our ambitious plans, dear participants of the summit, dear guests, I sincerely hope that the event, uh, such a representative event, we are opening up in the walls of our educational institution would allow higher education leaders to establish new long-term partnerships with colleagues and create significant international research and educational projects and collaborations. I hope that after a break, you will actively contribute to the round tables and find time. I would like to stress this once again. To tour, our, to tour our university labs, as well as the important uh, touristic sites of our capital, Kazan, especially that Kazan is today celebrating the Day of the Republic. There will be plenty of uh, various level events, which are open to all of us as well. Uh, I wish everyone fruitful work, new scientific discoveries, sound health, happiness, and well-being. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm giving floor to our head and uh, we probably will just, now it's time to listen to the main presentation, please Phil. Uh, play a, a short video to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker of the day. So thank you very much indeed. And we'll cue the video and then we'll be welcoming our first keynote. Thank you very much indeed. Traditionally and historically, of course, Russia was a great leader in science, technology, and in particular in mathematics and space science. And there's a youth anxious and eager for education and for development across the whole of the Federation. There's an ambition to think about um, the role of higher education in economic and social development, uh, the ways in which uh, those countries that might have been actually sending countries are actually themselves seeing themselves as major producers of knowledge, uh, receivers of students, uh, nurturers of talent. These events really help us understand that at the most profound level, what unites us is stronger than what divides us. It is a great pleasure for Tatarstan government as well as for the Russian Federation to host this event in Kazan City. And I would love to thank Times Higher Education and all of the participants uh, for investing their time into this very event. What I think about investment is that the best investment you can make is really into education. Друг друга, я имею в виду наших партнеров, когда мы интегрируем наши лаборатории в общие проекты для проведения тех или иных значимых для мира исследований, которые отвечают глобальным вызовам. Welcome to THE's inaugural Research Excellence Summit for Eurasia 
the first time ever we focused on this strategically vital region. Thank you, our uh, Prime Minister and Rector, distinguished guests, for uh, your speeches this morning. And as we're ready for our next session, um, I'm, uh, I was delighted to see um, this title come in from our, our next speaker, because not only does it directly respond to some of the, the central questions and provocations that we heard this morning and yesterday, but I think that um, the idea of the Belt the Road initiative has been around for you know, five, six years now and is quite a, a, an accepted and understood concept of the reality of, of our age. But this third point in the title, the moorings, whether they be physical, economic, intellectual, is certainly very much still up for discussion. And, um, and therefore, I'm delighted that the person who is uh, going to be talking with us coming next is, uh, is possibly more as qualified as anybody else working on this theme to, to, to discuss it with us today. She's a highly distinguished professor of sociology of education at the University of Cambridge. She's been studying the development of reforms of higher education models around the world since the 1980s. She's the editor-in-chief of Globalization Societies and Education magazine. And I'm sure she will give us plenty of ideas that we can discuss over the next two days and question and beyond this summit over the next 50 minutes. So please join me in welcoming Professor Susan Robertson. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the outstanding team of Times Higher, our wonderful uh, hosts, the uh, Republic of Tatarstan, and most particularly the uh, Federal U University of uh, Kazan, Kazan Federal University. It's such a great pleasure to be here with you, um, and thank you, Tim, for the very nice um, introduction. I can't think of a better place to be able to think with you, to encourage you to think with me around uh, the challenges that we're confronting around where to for global higher education. Um, but I also want to, uh, apart from talking about geostrategic uh, developments, the belt and the road, um, and challenges I think that the uh, minister presented us with uh, a little earlier around, well actually, is there any possibility for a future of higher education. I'm going to argue the counter, but I think they are arguments that we need to make. But some of that argument might actually emerge from the idea of um, a long history in higher education, a very, very long history that this part of the world is deeply, deeply aware of. So I'm going to start here with the idea of uh, myths. Global higher education isn't simply something that emerges in the 1980s, uh, coined by Roland Robertson, uh, in, to actually talk about fundamental changes taking place. I would actually want to argue that uh, the global has been uh, with us for a very long time, um, if we think of the uh, horizon of action being somewhere out there, I think human beings fundamentally, perhaps part of their DNA, are always mobile, moving out beyond. It's what the anthropologists tend to study when they actually look at uh, cultures that become more than simply um, groups that are located in one place. But there's a funny trick of memory and of history that now begins to emerge. Because suddenly we have this idea that the university is actually all to do with Europe. Okay? We have the wandering scholars moved between Rome and Paris largely. Some of the wandering scholars got tossed out of uh, Paris and went uh, partly because of what they were preaching, set up the uh, left bank partly because of precisely uh, the knowledges uh, were particularly challenging to the church. 
uh, but later set up in Oxford, thrown out of Oxford and into Cambridge. So, uh, but this is a recent history. This is a very recent history in, let's say, uh, the two millennia that the One Belt, One Road is attempting to point to and recover. Take a look at India, part of the One Belt, One Road initiative now. Okay? Nilanda in India, uh, in one of the states of India, in the 5th century AD, actually housed um, more than 10,000 young scholars learning that had come from all over that region to study under something like 2,000 uh, academics. They all boarded. Um, and it is this institution that uh, more recently is, has been renovated, uh, relaunched to join the 21st century. The famous economist Amartya Sen is actually leading the development of the renovation or the renewing of this university. So there's something about mooring and remooring and renovating, rather than despairing and discarding, there is something important about earlier efforts to engage with the challenge of the development of higher learning okay, and the challenge of the development of methods of curating of a culture, of a society, the knowledges that were important, that continue to exist, but should be available for the next generation. And here I'd actually point to, um, I've gone a bit close, um, El Elzar in Egypt. Um, here, important uh, activity around the curation of knowledge. And the libraries, particularly here in these institutions, enable us to understand ourselves in relation to our past, our present, and they are the gift to the future generation. So there's something important about the role of um, institutions of higher learning to do with the curation of knowledge as well as the development of the critical faculties of the next generation. But they do take different forms, and they weren't always necessarily tied to the church. And here I'd actually point to the wonderful temple of literature in Hanoi, forgotten uh, in this idea that the university belongs to Europe and modern Europe. The temple of literature in Hanoi, um, as you can see, dates from pretty much the same time as the University of Bologna, and in fact, slightly before. These wonderful um, sculptures of tortoises, which actually is the uh, symbol of Hanoi, um, coming from the lake, inscribed on the back of these tortoises are doctorates. So here is an institution of higher learning uh, a thousand years ago. Uh, still exists, it's a, a wonderful place to visit, but the, this was a place where the Mandarinate, which is where we take the term of the Mandarinate from, who actually uh, were key to becoming the civil servants, uh, advising the palace and so on. And these were incredibly important uh, uh, individuals uh, whose art uh, and craft, as it were, would be no different to the civil servants that actually populate our bureaucracies um, um, and so on. Um, and here I would actually think of the quintessential institution, Sciences Po, that uh, in, in Paris, in France, that produces the civil servants to a very high level of um, accomplishment. Move across in the University of Bologna in 1088, and you can see these are enduring institutions. They may have challenges, but they have deep anchors. They may extend out, as does the University of Bologna, into global space. Argentina has a, a branch campus of the University of Bologna in Argentina. So uh, older institutions have understood the challenge of becoming global institutions. They have uh, looked at uh, rival institutions uh, and the ways in which they've engaged in the 21st century um, 
developed uh, new kinds of uh, institutional structures that extend out into global space. Argentina is an awful long way from Italy. Um, at the same time, it enables, I think, a continuation of a commitment to higher learning that is at the heart of uh, everything that we've heard both yesterday and today here in Kazan. So these were towns and cities that were connected by an old Silk Road um, and in more recent times, uh, older and new, newer forms of empire building. Uh, where I grew up in Australia, in my early years, I would have semi-understood that I belonged to an extension of the empire of Great Britain. Um, Alan uh, Lau, yesterday presenting from Swinburne University in Australia, you get a very distinct sense that Australia is now no longer a part of the OECD countries, an extension of the empire connected to the British Empire, but firmly in Asia. And indeed, in the new Silk Road, to a large extent, the, the Belt and Road Initiative that I'll get onto, um, those parts of the world, Australia particularly, Singapore, Malaysia and so on, parts of older empires, have now been connected in quite important ways into the Asian region. So we had not only institutions, but we had important movements of scholars, knowledge, forms of higher learning, innovation taking place um, both historically and moving these into the present. I want to take you to my own institution, uh, Cambridge, a kerfuffle, uh, a major kind of fracas in Oxford and the scholars uh, were thrown out. But this was highly problematic. Many of the cities, the old cities, like here in Kazan, understood very clearly that hosting a university meant also a means of local economic development. Just as governments nowadays understand that uh, visiting students or international students are significant forms of investment that even include when their uh, parents and grandparents following the student come and visit them. The Australian government, for example, calculates those movements. These institutions have always, Bologna particularly, um, as, a, as a, a, a university in a city, uh, Oxford, Cambridge and so on, have understood absolutely clearly that having a university, and more than that, a world-class university in their city does something for their city. Okay? It puts their city on the global map. It essentially generates uh, local economic development. Students, academic staff, they require housing. They eat. Uh, they have cultural uh, elements of their life. They have children that go to school. So I would actually say Institutions like universities deeply, deeply more. They anchor um, the institution uh, very firmly into the bedrock of that place. And that's not to say that those places like Cambridge uh, don't face major challenges. Indeed, they do, and they look across the water to some extent to the new and rather different ways, for instance, Stanford University has had to uh, rethink the way in which it engages with the wider uh, ecosystem, in this case, Silicon Valley, uh, how uh, it uh, works with its young scholars in the various uh, departments and faculties within Stanford, uh, but then actually connects them out into the ecosystem looks at ways of generating new products. For example, venture capital uh, wasn't actually something, a financial product that was uh, particularly well known until Silicon Valley really gets going. And here what we have is quite a complex ecosystem that actually, if you study as uh, the uh, Annalise Sax Saxenian has, uh, the new Argonauts, what she begins to show here is that also the companies themselves uh, in Silicon Valley also began to think of different ways of working with each other. A contract, for example, would never actually go to one company. It would be half a contract. And this would be an interesting thing for uh, Kazan to actually think about as part of its development strategy. The idea here would be that actually firms always had 
let's say, never 360 degree vision around uh, where their blind sides were. So one of the uh, elements that uh, was particularly important to generating the success of Silicon Valley was actually a very interesting learning model that worked between the university but particularly between the firms in Silicon Valley where essentially it then positioned Silicon Valley to ultimately compete with MIT, uh, what was known as Route 128. But there have been important ruptures in the sector. And, and this is actually the more, and let's take it forward to the more recent period of globalization. Higher education is seen by governments as a, a really important uh, sector, services generating sector. So they would measure the movements of international students, calculate that. Uh, the Australian government does that par excellence, New Zealand as well, to the point that for the Australian government, it is the fourth largest income earner in GDP terms, the sale of education services. Mostly, but not exclusively, undergraduate students uh, finding that it's not easily feasible to get places in their own home uh, institutions or, or, or countries. Um, and the Australian government has, uh, in, in a very um, important way, um, developed all kinds of intelligence systems to feed back the health of the uh, growth of that sector. But there are uh, challenges that then are presented to countries around the integration of quite large populations of international students. You could wander around the city of Auckland and wonder whether, in fact, you weren't in a part of Asia. House prices have gone up significantly. Locals sometimes feel they're being pushed out. I could give you a similar story in relation to Hong Kong. Movements of students across the borders, uh, partly because being mobile actually has some kind of currency. And yet, at the same time, there are unmoorings, kind of dis equilibria kind of setting in in these cities as uh, essentially you have concentrations of populations um, and the figure is something in the order of 60% of the international students, mostly from the Asian region, uh, end up in Auckland. And that's quite dramatically changed the cityscape. So on the one hand, they are welcomed. On the other hand, you'll have uh, indigenous populations actually asking where do they fit in this new landscape. And these are important challenges for governments and policymakers as they set sail, as they move forward um, along a new belt and a new road and attempt to re-moor the project in rather different ways. Nin uh, 2013 um, was quite an important year, not least because the One Belt, One Road strategy was actually launched, but uh, we also had uh, Similar kinds of ideas. Uh, here we've got the avalanche uh, is, uh, is, is coming um, and uh, Michael Barber, who was the architect or the writer along with the team, uh, launched this for the IPPR, a uh, think tank in, uh, in England. And the idea here essentially is that universities uh, now facing the world are actually facing the possibility of their own distinction. What are they talking about? They're talking about the emergence of new digital platforms, uh, new players in the sector, uh, the idea that actually what you don't necessarily need is to go to a university. The uh, Clayton Christensen, who uh, writes a lot on creative destruction and disruptive technologies, um, actually argued that short of a few hundred institutions around the world that would be mega global institutions, uh, essentially the rest of the world, uh, the, the higher education world in terms of their infrastructures would have actually vanished and given ground to these new digital platforms, massive open online courses and so on. Some of the pundits at the time basically said they would disappear. We've always had technology, it will disrupt the sector, but essentially the, uh, the oldness, the weight of age, the history of these institutions will be on their side and they will continue. 
I think that is the case that they will continue, but my sense is to look inside, to look at uh, the possibilities, and I will, I will kind of move there toward the end of my talk. Um, but there are opportunities, I think, that uh, the fourth uh, industrial revolution, if we want to uh, take that metaphor, offers us both possibilities and uh, potential cautions about how we enter into that world. Um, the idea of a complete kind of devastation, I think, is uh, not on the cards, but that we will actually be moving in, in precisely the same way, but also at the same pace of the development of universities like Cambridge, 800 years. Um, it's quite confronting if you go to Peru and you realize Cambridge is older than the Incas. The Inca Empire, 1400s, Cambridge, 1200s. Okay, it's outlived the Incas even indeed go to Mexico and the Aztecs, but it will not be the same, it will not look the same. And it will not look the same for reasons like this. There's an ambitious, a very ambitious strategy launched by President Xi Jinping uh, in 2013, the One Belt, One Road. The old Silk Road is now a new belt. The new roads, uh, the, the, new, uh, the new roads are actually some of the port uh, infrastructures, um, the maritime connections that you can see here. Tatarstan is bang in the middle um, here uh, between the so-called east and the west. Um, and most recently, or earlier this year in May, I was invited to the celebration of Peking University's 120 years, simply a, a, a little one really, if we think of actually um, the University of, the Federal University of Kazan, uh, which is 1804, so you're much older, um, or almost as old as, as, as that, in, no, not quite as old actually, um, as that institution. My reading as a, as a uh, kind of, a scholar of higher education but with a deep interest in politics has been that China herself has been quite thwarted around the regional strategies, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership it deliberately from the US side excluded China. This was to be a game that essentially was making China to be a rule taker rather than a rule maker. Um, China has had a kind of uh, engaged but rather peripheral relationship, uh, an on-off sort of relationship with the ASEAN regional agreements and so on. So it has gotten going on its own strategy and potentially on its own terms um, and it's an ambitious strategy and as Max Weber, the famous sociologist, will tell you, all uh, developments particularly around uh, capitalism, particularly in the expansion of markets and so on, requires infrastructures. And this is a big and very ambitious uh, infrastructure that is being launched. It is a new regional growth strategy uh, that enables uh, China to connect back to this historic past. Okay? Uh, it has, and it points to the diligent and courageous people across Eurasia who explored and opened up several routes of trade and cultural exchanges that linked major civilizations of Asia, Europe, and Africa, collectively called the Silk Road. And this may well be a mechanism to bring Africa in because essentially Africa, in many of our accounts of the expansion of higher education, absolutely fall short. We might look at the Latin American world, Mercosur, um, Alba and many of those with the BRICS, uh, but the African part of the world is actually um, largely ignored. So is this a new world of higher education? Is this the century of uh, the Asian uh, awakening, the stirring of the lion as the uh, Chinese president uh, has launched it? Most certainly it is China declaring that it will no longer want to suffer what it called the century of humiliation, and I think it's absolutely right there. So is the genie out of the bottle, and what's in Pandora's box? In other words, what new challenges um, are on the table, and what new directions and movements are we actually uh, seeing? One of the things we can see, if we're looking at the 1990s quite quickly, is we saw a rapid expansion of students going to OECD countries. Education sectors were included as parts of uh, the trade figures. Uh, if you know New Zealand, it's the third largest income earner over and above 
wine, which is uh, New Zealand wine is known all over the world. Growing numbers of branch campuses, but hang on. Who's turned up in Oxford? There's a branch of Peking University. Okay? So there's an, uh, older uh, branch campuses from places like Malaysia had moved themselves into parts of Africa. There had been across Europe the standardization from the Bologna ar um, architecture and uh, regional agreements like ASEAN um, into the Latin American world, Mercosur, uh, and, and so on, um, as well as the rise of global quality assurance data. But if we go to the right-hand uh, column here from 2000 on, but particularly 2010 onwards, what we see are declining populations, um, both in the East and the West, which will actually set up new kinds of challenges. Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, all have um, uh, reproduction rates of young babies uh, that sit, sits at about 0.8. Okay? So, all of those places are actually looking out to internationalize and to uh, recruit uh, the future workers, learners and workers for their population. So this is going to quite radically um, multiculturalize their populations in ways in which the expansions of their higher education sectors will also need to be very, very attentive to what happens as in Auckland, you get expansions of uh, groups from other parts of the world and how best to integrate them. Singapore knows this only too well, a very rapid expansion under the Global Singapore Schoolhouse Initiative, uh, very large numbers, it went from almost none to quite close to uh, something about 80 odd thousand uh, students and this is actually a very significant number if you think that uh, somewhere in the order of about 800,000 international students turn up in the United States. So given the size of Singapore and housing that number of students there is quite challenging. But if you actually uh, look at the figures, and uh, this is where I think data is important, um, and, uh, the ch and, and using those figures to actually look beyond the story of the success of the internationalizing of students to Europe, is that you can actually see a counterflow. Uh, the US-based students, maybe they're in study abroad uh, programs and so on in China, but nevertheless they are the second largest population to turn up studying in China, okay? along with African students. And that number will set to rise, particularly as uh, American families uh, wonder and think themselves geostrategically and also economically about where's the best future for their child? Where will the jobs be? Um, in a ma moment of folly, I would want to argue, the UK government uh, put out a very strong proposal that they would be the magnet economies. So it would be the Asian world that would be doing the laboring and the high uh, in skill value added would take place in places like the UK and so on. But the UK at the moment is beset by problems to do with immigration, letting international students come in, um, international students feel as if they're not welcome because of the way in which the politics around uh, immigration um, policies are actually um, being kind of played with. International students are included as the migrant uh, numbers in the UK. And this is having quite devastating effects on uh, our capacity actually in the UK to stay both in the game and potentially ahead of the game. At the same time, China and uh, Singapore, Malaysia, all of those countries, and indeed here in uh, Kazan and universities, so Tatarstan and Kazan, they have percentages of international students that they would actually want to ultimately do what uh, John Henry Newman had as the idea of the university. It is a universe. It is a coming together of the knowledges of the world. Uh, but it will require quite important, hard thinking um, and not simply just ramping up figures about how do we integrate different cultures um, and ways in which we show that we value, value the knowledges. 
So this will require, it seems to me, um, some ways not only of thinking of those challenges, but which kind of uh, model for development. Uh, one of the things that I think characterizes the beginnings of the 2000s is that we can actually see interesting kinds of experiments across the Gulf world, for example, Dubai, uh, you could go to Saudi, for instance, uh, Oman, another place, um, Singapore. All of them have been experimenting, not with slow growth, several hundred years, if not 800 years, uh, institutional development model, but a different way in which you could actually partner, let's say, with the best in the world, have exchanges, and if we take the Singapore Global Schoolhouse there uh, as an example, it has invited in bits of the best of universities from around the world. Quite a strong level of state monitoring around the delivery of quality. But this is an interesting uh, way in which you can, in the case of Singapore, uh, grow quite dynamically in a very short uh, period of time. And um, we have then the mixing of you know, very high levels of, of, of knowledge and for the for Singapore, it's an attempt to also stem the flow out of some of their uh, people who went to study elsewhere, but also to bring the brightest and the best uh, into Singapore. It's not plain sailing, and it rubs up sometimes uh, and finds itself very destabilized by um, politics. But this is actually where politics and the economy would actually need to begin to think together. If I go on. So there are new, uh, thinking about that disruptive dynamics, nevertheless, um, that I actually also want to point to. Um, we often think of the sector as a rather coherent sector, put the university in the middle, and we don't actually think of all the different and quite innovative ways those who are in that ecosphere, the higher education ecosphere, are actually thinking in very imaginative and creative ways about them themselves entering into the sector. The students that did MOOCs, and uh, for my sins, actually, uh, in 2014, uh, with my colleague Chris Olds, we actually developed and ran a MOOC. We had 18,000 students in our class. But any of those students now who could get a, uh, a certificate of participation can actually now say that they would actually potentially like to take out their certificate as what is actually being called a micro credential. Okay. So many of us thinking about Bologna think of three years, two years, three years. Okay. What do we do with micro-credentials? And how do micro-credentials, or we could use another term, nano-credentials, how do we add one, two, three micro-credentials and what's called stackability and get something that's a set of competences for, let's say, a company like Siemens? Would they be interested? Maybe. Uh, partly as it seems to me the micro-credentials now have the possibility of enabling, let's say, uh, a, a scientist, perhaps say a theoretical physicist, to actually maybe gather, or potential young theoretical physicist, to gather particular knowledge as maybe in the social sciences world. Steve Jobs, if he was standing here, would say that actually his technology did the engineering second and the aesthetics first. Okay? So, what are we actually doing inside our own institutions to actually begin to think uh, as to what that kind of challenge might mean? Let's go to the right, uh, blockchain. What's the challenge here? MIT, for example, at the moment in the United States is actually uh, enabling every individual student to encrypt their credential unique to them on a blockchain. Um, what will this do to how we actually think both of uh, the movements potentially of students? So this now frees up once we go with micro-credentials, not all of our degree being necessarily located in one place. And then it raises the interesting question of how do we credentialize? Who will be the credential, credentializing agency? We're not short of particular uh, companies. Pearson, for example, has been particularly interested in maybe playing that kind of role. Other game changers. Most of you uh, can't have avoided some kind of bumping into uh, one of a number of different firms. LinkedIn is a good example. It was the largest uh, tech uh, buy-up 
um, by Microsoft uh, several years back, uh, and LinkedIn essentially here is uh, engaged in really what it sees as uh, thinking about employability and, and, and thinking with um, students who are in universities uh, and ways in which they actually might begin to think about who do they need to know, what are the nature of the skills that they've acquired, and how do they actually think about where they actually go into the future, what kinds of jobs, and then jobs are being kind of sent to them. Historically, this was our career services in the university. Okay? Um, but if we actually now go to the right, there's a new competitor on the block, Google for Jobs. Google has announced most recently that it's actually in using machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, be the uh, biggest broker in the world for thinking about how uh, students, particularly in our case, or academics, um, see their credentials and uh, they can be the object of where are the jobs and, and, and so on. Will this make uh, movement into jobs and movement to and from jobs, in and out of jobs uh, quicker? I, I don't know, but these will be very interesting kinds of uh, developments. So over the last day uh, and today, we've heard a lot about the way in which we engage with the wider industry. But I guess my question and my challenge to us here today is to think about the way in which the new digital technologies, University 4.0, if we want to put it that way, will actually, to some extent, um, pull away some of the historic uh, responsibilities from the university around careers, employability, and so on. Um, and some of these are actually being picked up and being picked up by new players in the sector. And quite a bit of my own recent research has been to um, not just look at the obvious player like the university, but the myriad of many players uh, in the sector who have got uh, products to sell, uh, mobility um, experiences to sell to students, credit to lend to students. Uh, you could actually go right out there into peer-to-peer -peer lending and the student lending market, for example, actually has investors here and a student who wants to take out a loan here, and the bank is actually now gone. Okay? Uh, we can actually see uh, not just uh, crowdfunding, but, uh, or, but crowdfunding for funding research projects. Again, this will turn the university inside out as many of these new platforms, um, what we might call the platform university, as a potential contender. Um, as one of the potential kind of players now in this new world. To what extent will the One Belt, One Road provide a space for invention, innovation, experimentation across the Belt and Road as uh, older institutions actually maybe willingly grasp the possibilities that the new technologies uh, actually put on the table for uh, enabling uh, a rapid reinvention, a kind of a, a kind of an unanchoring and a new mooring in different kinds of ways. So how do we um, manage the new challenges? And I've got two to three uh, thoughts, uh, several slides here. One is building or renewing. So how do institutions build or renew? Um, and I would say the um, Federal University of Kazan is um, absolutely impressive in what it's up to. Um, building a new brand in the context of both uh, a, a, a nation, but actually the possibilities of new strategic uh, spatial developments, one belt, one road. But without losing sight of local priorities, and that's actually some of the challenge. How do they recruit and retain international faculty and students and generate an imaginative and curiosity-driven culture without creating different tiers? And that's one of the problems when you get these different uh, uh, faculty who, uh, and we see to some extent some of the, uh, the uh, Gulf universities kind of struggling with this. How do they manage partnerships and collaborations which respect distinct institutional cultures, but ensure the distinctiveness of the local and the national? How do they bring in excellent teaching, research, innovation, and engagement, and what does that begin to look like? It's the last bit of that is something that universities historically have not done and uh, particularly well. 
How do they take the best of the new digital technologies and be attentive to the overall need to put these to the use of excellence, engage with the, the wider local economy, and at the same time, and this is very important, manage academic freedom? How do they, to some extent, avoid the Wild West? What conditions would need to be in place so that the promise of the, in this case, in this part of the world, the One Belt, One Road, that of the East and the West, deliver and the promise of the, uh, the, the One Belt, One Road is multipolarity. Okay? This idea that there's not one single European image of what's the best university, but actually there's a proliferation of possibilities, which has to be the only way forward. Um, how do we actually make sure government policies are in place to ensure that the sector as the whole benefits from investing in the best and not so simply the, the kind of the elites, which has actually historically been a problem for the universities, um, that they actually do ensure that higher education benefits from the technological advances and uses data well. And I've just kind of left, um, these are my thoughts about the university is at its best. Uh, when they're open-minded, when they're imaginative, they're outward-looking and have excellence built into everything that they do. That they value plurality and dialogue, not only within the, the academy but with their wider communities and societies. And finally, that they do understand their mandate to create, to circulate, to curate um, esoteric and practical knowledges and engage the next generations in this societal, important societal purpose. So in closing, I believe there is an important place for the university into the future, but it will require, it does, some re-anchoring and some re-mooring. And when it's attentive to that task, it will have another century at least ahead of it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I have a very um, basic metric of assessing quality in terms of the number of people taking pictures of slides, and there were pretty much everybody was taking photos all through your presentation as a guide of how good that was. We've got um, some time on the clock now for questions. I've got questions of my own, but before I start, can I just ask, is there anybody who wants to immediately um, take up some of the challenges that, that Susan just posed? Or are you going to think? I would like, therefore, to ask your last point about data, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously the dominant currency of our, of our lives, almost our modern economies now is a surveillance economy. Within a university context, I mean, how do you feel like that's almost a, a new digital divide, the, the, the universities, the institutions that have got access to, to student data, even perhaps to faculty data? Is that going to be the new the new driver of, of universities that, that can use that effectively to, to really accelerate their, their progress and accelerate towards their missions against those that don't have the access or don't understand how to use it properly? How, how can that change a university's um, position? Okay. So my sense is that data by itself, we can have good and bad data. Um, so the question, it seems to me, is what kind of data are we collecting and what are we using it for? So my thought then really about data is it's absolutely crucial. Uh, we use data, uh, our teaching excellence framework data comes back to us, let's say, at the University of Cambridge, and we think um, about why is it that, let's say, students are happy, not happy, want to be challenged further and so on. So quite often I would probably say, and particularly around teaching and learning, uh, they've often been closed classroom spaces. You know, we get a sense, you know, if a student walks past me and says, that's fabulous to my lecture, I think, huh, ah, thank you. But short of that, often we haven't had, I think, good data. And now, it's not to say universities haven't done evaluations, but some of the evaluations actually you would actually want to put to the side. You know, an evaluation that says, I wish my lecturer would wear you know, more trendy clothes, actually doesn't really tell you much about you know, the quality of the teaching and learning. And to be honest, that's been some of the kind of um, data that you might have gotten back you know, in universities where I've seen student evaluations. Um, but it is important that we both collect data but then use data kind of sensibly to think about uh, 
what can be done, how do we use that to plan forward, you know, we don't just do what we've always done because that's what we've always done and so on. So sure, we live in a world of data, but can we, can we make sure that we understand the kind of questions that generated that data, the kind of questions that we actually want then to pose of that data, uh, then it seems to me that the way in which we'd use that data to you know, both diagnose the problems and then look at where we might get a year from now and two years from now and so on. And would you foresee that that data should be used and retained by the institution for its personal development and performance decision making? Or do you think that there could be a uniformity of data within a national system, for example, so that students or prospective students or faculty could... could you, is it possible to have data that's relevant across, in a UK context, an institution like Cambridge and equally an institution um, like the University of Hull, which is, um, which is lower down the rankings for but people who aren't familiar. But it's more or less up the road from Cambridge, <laughs> yeah. as, it, as it were. Um, these are different kinds of institutions, and one of the problems, it seems to me, that uh, when we put, let's say, uh, institutions into some kind of ranking, and, uh, and, and I think the Times higher has actually tried to differentiate different types of institutions with different kinds of histories and so on. Um, it's simply not possible to, let's say, compare the student of, uh, uh, the experience of a student or at Hull. Um, it may well be a particularly um, wonderful experience. But let me just give you an example of Cambridge. If I give a lecture, a student is entitled, funded by the college, to have one hour of tutoring around the lecture that I give. And that would apply to all of the lectures. So now we've got two rather differently resourced experiences for students. So what we would need to do would be to make sure that we're actually using uh, data sets of equivalences, not um, quite different kinds of institutions with different intakes, different mandates, and so on. So wisdom around the use of data, I think, um, and wisdom on the part of our institutional um, senior administrators, you know, um, is important. Um, we've got a question I saw from um, the president of the University of Tehran. Is, is there, a, I think there's a microphone just coming, one sec, because we'll record it. Uh, thank you very much, Suzanne Vici. She, she reviewed the history of uh, universities. I first have a comment and want to enrich this uh, review that the oldest university in the world was the John de Chapur, 70, 100 years ago. And it was interesting that it's a complex university and it has the all elements of the modern universities. And may I have asked you about the few, how to link the future of universities to the social, their social responsibility, how their contribution on the development of regional and international could be in the future, uh, impact on the future of the universities. That's an excellent question, and I appreciate uh, that, and partly because this is actually the challenge for our discussions both today and tomorrow. Um, perhaps the idea of the mooring, you know, a ship moors, and it's very easy to kind of be seduced by the global and think that your circuit is um, beyond the, the local population. You know, the, uh, in the case of the UK, it would be Oxford, Cambridge, the Russell Group, the Ivy League, and so on. But there are deep responsibilities to local communities um, that I believe that uh, universities at their best understand and recognise. And actually, to be fair, if I look at uh, the University of Cambridge, there's a serious amount of uh, investment in uh, local and regional uh, development. Uh, but you asked the question about the social, um, and here that would be an interesting question about who, in the case of... Uh, the local population ends up going to Cambridge. I mean, is there a, a mechanism, let's say, of, for elite institutions to make sure that um, students who live in that region actually also have a fair enough chance to turn up in Cambridge? Uh, universities like Oxford and Cambridge are deeply aware of that and of the challenge of that, and there are quite interesting uh, innovations, let's say, at the University of Bristol, where I was, um, of identifying, let's say, high school students with promise but never 
the kinds of resources that families from more well-off homes would be able to put into them and have actually got quite an interesting uh, program bringing those young students through that university. So the idea that actually the brains, the knowledge, the, 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 the capabilities or the possibilities to become someone because you are bright enough but you now need a bit more institutional uh, wisdom to identify bright students in local communities that may not have had ambitions to go to the universities. The responsibility, is, as both Cambridge, Oxford and cities like Bristol recognise, it is their responsibility to do something about that. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from um, at the back. different university level interactions, you particularly mm -hmm. this triangular model where you had the, the groups coming together. I would like to put it as a question to an extent, not just about education now, but an, an, you know, we're a research and innovation hub as part of the title. You know, much of what I would tell you at a micro level, the individual academic level, we, we sort of do that anyway, right? I mean, that's what we're doing. And is this, so what the question I'm like, is the desire to assess universities and rank universities on numbers, maybe losing us some of what our academics can do in terms of you might be at, you know, ranked, you know, 689 university, but you're interacting with people in different units to provide not just the deliverance of knowledge, but the creation of new knowledge in those networks. And that we need, we also need at some point to recognize, and I don't know how you do this, you know, recognize that the, the value that academics can do in their interactions and how they make this global interaction of d generation of knowledge important. And I see a lot of that, you know, here within in Russia too. Yes. I mean, you're absolutely right. One of the problems if we go to what I would kind of, you know, let's say forms of ranking is that we, we lose the granu granuality of things. And um, the only way you could get that back, it seems to me, would be to uh, absolutely ensure that the incentive structures in institutions um, then begin to value certain things. So if what's valued, and I believe it should be valued, um, connections with the industry, and they could be all kinds of connections. If you're uh, in a faculty of education, this may well be schools in the wider community. Okay. Um, you may well be an engineer, but this might well mean you know, Microsoft and whoever else, but even local engineering firms and so on. Um, in the UK, I would say that the so-called engagement and impact agenda has tried to pick that up and that is also now built into the promotions systems and the systems of recognition. So you can be a more esoteric uh, researcher, um, but there's huge incentive now for you to begin to think um, about how you engage and communicate um, your science to that wider public. Um, and I had the great privilege of having a conversation with you uh, last evening uh, uh, about these issues. Um, how do s scientists, uh, of social scientists, scientists, natural scientists, how do we, and this is a challenge, the more we ask for taxpayers' money uh, or the backing of government, we actually have a responsibility to communicate our science to our local communities to our national communities and to our global communities. Now, they may well be different kinds of genres of communication, but that is, I, I, I would want to say, something that distinguishes the Humboldt notion of the university, the German model of the university, the university and research connected to that wider community that funded many of the, that was the model of the state universities in the United States, versus the idea that you remain cloistered which is the Newman idea, inside the university, and it was your state of higher becoming. Um, my sense is uh, maybe the state of higher becoming is you want that space to think about fundamental questions, blue sky research and so on, but a Newman scholar needs to become a Humboldtian scholar and actually see a responsibility to producing knowledge for the wider community and not for an internal audience. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very sorry, but we've run out of our scheduled time for this particular session. Um, but we are going to go into a, a half-hour coffee break, so I'm sure that um, we'd love to have continue these conversations over a drink. But please join me in thanking again. Thank you, team.
greatly, Professor Thank Susan you. Robertson.